name is Shantae, and this is the Bring a Folding Chair series. BAFC is a talk series where guests come together to discuss diverse topics and the importance of bringing all seats to the table. Today's topic is the 1619 story with William Tucker. And our special guest today is Vincent Tucker, pronouns he, him. Vincent, I'm so glad that you are here today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Shante, and thank you for having me. Well, I'm Vincent Tucker. I am the president of the William Tucker 1624 Society. I am originally from Hampton, Virginia, graduate of Virginia State University, and I am a business owner of 32 years. Hey, awesome. Thank you. So, Vincent, I hope you brought your folding chair. Let's get started with these questions. So our first question is, tell us the story of William Tucker. What is the story of him in 1619? Uh, thank you, and that's a wonderful question, of cer certainly a great question to lead with. Uh, and William Tucker, the story goes back to around 1619 when uh, off of the coast of Luanda in Angola, uh, during that time, the Angolans uh, were colonized by the Portuguese. <clears throat> and that's when uh, they were under their rule, under their control. So this is the beginning when uh, the Africans there were taken to uh, the uh, Kwanzaa uh, River, uh, to the larger ships that were sail across the Atlantic Ocean. At that point, they were enslaved. Uh, now, uh, slavery had already begun um, in South America and also the Caribbean islands uh, and beyond. So the slavery or having those enslaved was not new. So during that time in 1619, the, San Juan, uh, the uh, enslaved Africans were boarded up um, on to the San Juan Batista to set sail across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in the process, uh, that ship was privatized by two other ships, the White Lion and also uh, the Treasurer. Uh, during that time, it was about 350 uh, enslaved Africans on that ship. And so when that ship was uh, prioritized, privatized, privateer, <laughs> I'm getting my words all twisted up. <laughs> I do the same. <laughs> um, the white lion could only take a portion of the cargo. So they, they took about 20 and odd of the um, enslaved. Now, prior to that, the San Juan Batista was headed out to Veracruz, Mexico. So on that long journey of, of boarding the White Lion coming to uh, Fort Monroe, or then it was called Point Comfort, uh, those Africans were traded for supplies and food. Um, Virginia was not a state at that point. Uh, it was a colony as well. And that is the beginning of the story of 1619 and the White Lion and, and the Tuckers, uh, Antony and Isabel, uh, were two of the individuals on that ship. And when they were traded uh, and put in the hands of Captain William Tucker, uh, five years later, 19, in 1624, is when they uh, had the child, uh, William which was named after the slave owner, the plantation owner. Wow. So how does this William Tucker um, relate to now your family, the Tuckers with the William Tucker 1624 Society? How do we go from um, 1624 to now 2022? Yes. Uh, so a little over 400 years ago, right? So um, we were, the Tuckers were always told that we were already always in that region or that, that part of town. And so um, several years ago, uh, other family members, Thamel Williams, um, began to 
research our family and to uh, to follow the lead of those stories that were passed down from generation to generation. We have always been here, which is the oral history. So she began to research and find other family members and, and stories that will continue to take us back to the early 1800s. Uh, and since then, other family members have come on board to help research and Ancestry.com and African Ancestry and those um, uh, organizations like that would help, you know, give us clarity on DNA, exactly where we're from. But we realized that uh, there were several fires or a couple of fires in the Hampton Roads, Point Comfort area over the years. So a lot of um, records have been destroyed. So we're relying on our oral history that uh, to take us back. Wow. That's amazing that you can, as a family, say we are connected to this one specific person in 1619, 1624, to have kept that oral history alive for so long to be able 400 years later to have that connection and be able to expand on it and tell the story of William Tucker to the masses. So the, six, the William Tucker 1624 Society, what is the purpose of it? And what's your, your role within the society? Well, the society is relatively new. Um, my father and your grandfather and um, our relatives started a society um, or before they had a name, they were coming together to talk about the history. And for many years before they even came together legally, they would always talk about our family history, <clears throat> where we came from, working ethics and things of that nature. Uh, from generation to generation, what we did and talked about the entrepreneurs um, and so on. So in 19... Six, 19 I'm sorry, in 2016, 2017 is when we took the name, um, the William Tucker 1624 Society and just made it a legal society. It was all, already in existence, but it just it was lacking some legality. So that's when we got our charter in the state of Virginia and began to move forward. Now, the mission of the William Tucker 1624 Society is to educate the greater public about the stories of the first Africans to arrive in Virginia, uh, the earliest of the British colonies. William Tucker is known to be the first child, African descent, born and baptized in Virginia, by extension, the continent of the United States of America. The William Tucker 1624 Society conducts research into the life of William Tucker and that of his descendants. As we gain insight into the strength and resilience of, of the Africans who built and populated the United States of America. We document, preserve, and share the narratives. And also what uh, the society does, it collaborates with other organizations that are like-minded. And we really, because if you go back into history, uh, we don't own any of this. Mm -hmm. We're just a society to help uh, navigate and to share our story but there's millions of stories out here and every African-American have their own story. Uh, many of them will probably be very similar in terms of some of the struggles uh, that their ancestors have uh, come through over the years. So um, we, uh, one thing we like to do is build upon uh, scholarships for education purposes and to continue to dig and deep into our own history and to see how far we can go back. Yeah, telling your story is important. That's why I have this talk series so that everybody's able to have a space to tell their different stories, their different perspectives, different experiences, because maybe came from one similar place, but everybody has differences that make their experience and their stories slightly different or even Absolutely. hugely different. So it's so important to be able to tell your story about your family, especially, and make sure that others understand and can hear it. So when you guys are out telling your story, um, 
where has your story been told? Has it been put in newspapers and put on television? Um, you mentioned you collaborate with different events. I know the, the 1619 commemorative events. Have there been any others? Overall, what are some of the outreach and just events the society has participated in? Okay, so one piece, important piece that I left off is that so the society um, is the owner of the Tucker Cemetery. Okay. So the Tucker Cemetery was purchased around 1896 from other family members or wow. uh, and other friends that were called the Excelsior Club. And I think that purchase was uh, for $100. It's a two and a half acre lot with um, and is located about a quarter of a mile of where we believe the plantation was that our ancestors mm -hmm. lived on. And we believe that that cemetery is where the Blacks, you know, were, were buried away from the plantation. Uh, so it was called the Old Colored Cemetery uh, or Graveyard in 1896, so it was, it was pretty old then. Yeah. And so in, in, in 2017, I believe, we had a radar scan, a penetrating radar scan, and we discovered about 106 or 107 um, graves that were underground. Wow. So we began to tag those, and we knew that we were on something. The state of Virginia kicked in and they wanted to preserve that land. And so um, a large portion of their property is reserved and is considered historic. Oh, that's amazing. So when you ask about uh, what, what have we done? Uh, so USA Today uh, in, tw in 2019 took a journey to Angola, the motherland and took um, Wanda Tucker with them because they wanted to know how much truth our story holds. Mm -hmm. And so they chose to research um, and to, to travel to Angola just to follow the story. And they were amazed. <clears throat> so I can say today that uh, the USA Today newspaper has followed us over the past four or five years and local newspapers. And actually, if you just, if someone were to just Google uh, Tucker family, Hampton, Virginia, or 1619 Tucker family, we will probably be all over the, all over their computer. <laughs> so, um, and I'm glad you brought this question up because we just got back from Angola. Uh, the president, Lurinko, um, of Angola invited several members of the Tucker family to come and to learn and to um, just get a better, better understanding of their culture and who they are. And since then, we are beginning to we have begun to uh, just come together as as a family, really, because when we were taken from there in 1619, remember we left family there, mm -hmm. so we still have. Uh, skin in the game um, in Angola. So we're looking forward to collaborating with organizations, schools, if possible. Uh, we have spoken to churches, other nonprofit organizations, just to share our history and story. Mm -hmm. And mainly we want African Americans to know that um, we come from a powerful country. We, 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 we've come from a country where there were kings and queens and, and um, you know, we weren't enslaved many years ago. And so it's no sense of hanging your head down low, rise up um, and pull from the strength of your ancestors and keep moving forward. Yes, exactly. We come from some amazing people back in Africa and even just right here in the United States, our history here. Some amazing people have been here before us. And, you know, after us, we'll still have some amazing people. So in that recent Angola trip, how long were y'all there? Who, did you go? Were you, yes, were you one of yes. the ones there? I was one of the chosen ones. And um, 
We were there for about five days in December, 2021. And I really wasn't sure how to brace myself or what to expect. So I went in with an open mind. So um, the culture is different. Um, it was, it was some of what you may see Africa is like, or parts of Africa on TV. Uh, there were some, you know, impoverished areas. But what I learned was that uh, Angola really just became a country, an independent country, I think in 1975 or 1979. So, and they have been dealing and, and battling in civil wars up until the early 2000s. So I can see why the country uh, is in the condition that it's in, but it's very rich. Um, Angola is the third largest diamond producer in the, in the world. And they are certainly rich with, enriched with uh, gold, oil, and gas. And their culture, agri uh, agriculture, and the land, and the, you know, the rich soil um, is, is just wonderful. So they, they are high producers of, of a lot of good produce. And to just ride by and, and see the mango trees and mango. bananas and coconut, I mean, not coconuts, um, pineapple, uh, it's just amazing. So we're definitely planning a trip back there this year. Ooh, great. You know, quick question. What, out of all the things you maybe did in those five days in Angola, what was your favorite experience? Was it the food? I feel like for me, I would just enjoy the food so much. Well, the food was delicious. I wasn't sure um, if it would be rich, what exactly, you know, were they eating? You know, here we have spots and croakers and trout on the other side of the world. I didn't know what type of fish they had, nor, you know, um, but it was, it was wonderful. The food was delicious. They treated us like royalty. Oh, wow. And my most exciting part was when we entered uh, one or two of the villages and there were all the small children just smiling and waving and welcoming us into their village. And that was a very beautiful part because I felt a deep connection at that point that we're all together. We are one big family. And they embraced us and I wanted to embrace them as well. So that was, that was really important for me. Yes, that sounds so important, like a wonderful trip. And yes, I hope y'all do go back soon in this upcoming year and continue to go back in the upcoming years to come that keep that relationship with Angola and its people. So this is, that was one connection you all have, and it sounds like you have many different connections and partnerships um, across the world since now you've been to Angola. One of, what was one of your, one of the society's earliest partnerships who, when you were little and small, who was out here rooting for the society and the um, mission you guys are out here to achieve? I would say it started with our Aunt Thama, which was probably in the 70s, going into the 80s. My father, your grandfather, Aunt Brenda, Aunt Diane, uh, Uncle Edwin. And, and those siblings were uh, the, real, the ones that spearheaded the society. And so now we're a different generation and we're looking to take it further. And the next generation, uh, which will include you, hopefully will come in and continue the legacy and uh, continue to move the society forward. So I tell you a real good connection that, that we have um, made over the past year and a half or since 2019. So after the commemoration in 2019, in the city of Hampton at our uh, cemetery. Right after that, um, the Angolans at the Smithsonian Institute or Smithsonian Museum invited us, I think it was November or December of that year to celebrate us. Now we didn't have a clue of what this was all about. We didn't know nothing from nothing. 
we showed up and there was about 300, 350 Africans at the Smithsonian uh, that celebrated us and honored us and showed us that, you know, we're, we're family mm -hmm. and they embraced us. It was a wonderful feeling. Since then, uh, we have invited the ambassador uh, to Angola to speak at one of our events. Uh, we have shared the same platform together on other, um, with other programming, you know, of other organizations. And so that has really opened the door. So in June or July, the ambassador came down 2021 to speak to, um, at our August, August event, also the Minister of Culture. And that relationship has really built, um, been built over the months. So now we got a, a phone call or a letter. They're sending 30 people from the embassy or staff members mm -hmm. to hang out with us in February. Not just us, but the city of Hampton as well, mm -hmm. just to get to learn our story and continue to build, up, build upon that relationship. And with that type of connection, is really opening doors and um, minds of people who can now see a connection because mm -hmm. you're bringing part of Africa here to the U.S. Uh, to share their stories as well. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot. It's really keeping us busy. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And this is just so amazing. And you're thinking about Hampton itself is a very rich historical city, huge important part of the history of Virginia, the history of the country. And then we bring it, in, putting in the William Tuckers, the Tucker Society, the Tucker family, and what you guys are now bringing to the city of Hampton. It's like, wow. Yes, yes. The city of Hampton and Fort Monroe do see value in our family. And every time there's an event, they certainly reach out to us to see if we would like to participate. And, and to share that history. So at Fort Monroe, at the um, Visitor and Education Center, there is a display of the Tucker family there in that museum portion of the Visitor Center. So we feel very honored for that. And, um, and, and they're always calling us for something. And as long <laughs> as they're offering a meal, I will probably always go. <laughs> Keeping y'all busy. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I have about a couple more questions. So with your relationship with the city of Hampton and Fort Monroe, do you guys have any community initiatives, some initiatives for back home that you're, the society is hoping to do now or even in the future? So let me back up a little bit. So <laughs> over this past year, year and a half, we have... Um, join forces with uh, organizations that would uh, feed the, the needy, you know, the, the homeless. And um, so that's one initiative. And we, we have talked about the scholarship and we're looking to really uh, move forward with that for 2022. Uh, we're making some, some ground, but we really just want to blow that out the water. Uh, there's an organization, um, I can't think of the name of it, I want to say RICO, uh, but I might be wrong. So it's an African organization that we uh, we are trying to partner with them just for outreach opportunities and to help each other learn each other's culture and just support each other's events, culture events. So I think that's really important that we find other um, organizations that are willing to go back into history to learn of the African culture um, and the history, good, bad, and, and, and different, and yeah. just begin to build on the wealth of uh, not just that the country of Angola, but the continent of Africa. So uh, we're definitely looking forward to expanding those areas. Okay. So as you're gaining to do this scholarship and other um, initiatives in the future. What what are ways people can help the society? Can people donate? Can they visit the cemetery? 
what are some ways that the little people, the outside members can do? Well, we have some sites on our website. I think it's uh, William Tucker 1624 society.org. Uh, we are accepting donations to help with those initiatives of giving to the needy, um, to the hungry, and to build the scholarship fund. Um, the cemetery right now is, is a separate entity. They're doing okay, but in the future, we will certainly need uh, funding to continue the upkeep with that. But right now, we really want to build on the scholarship because we feel that education is the key and we're lacking a, a lot of our education in the schools, the colleges, and even our communities. Um, we, we really want to build people up, build up the communities to make them stronger and to know the land in which they uh, have come from. So it's very important to us. All right, this is my second to last question. So we've talked a lot in this about 30th minutes of our conversation. Um, so out of all the many things you have participated in the society in the past couple years, since it began in about 2016, 2017, or even before that when it wasn't the official society, what has been one of your favorite moments in memory? One of my favorite moments, I would say, when we commemorated uh, the 1619 story um, in 2019. At our event, we had about 400 participants, and I had no idea that we could get 400 chairs at the cemetery. <laughs> and of course, it was before COVID, and to have worldwide coverage. That was probably the highlight of, of uh, the last, over the last five or six years for me. Wow. And that 2019 commemoration was the 400th anniversary of 1619, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So that was a very important celebration going on. Yes, yes. And I can tell you another event. Uh, I spoke at a uh, organization just a couple of months ago, the, the Royalty, Royalty Rotary Club um, in Virginia, but it was in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I really didn't know anything about the organization, um, but it was, you know, all Caucasian. And to be in that setting, to, to share with them the family history uh, was amazing. I came in with a piece of paper and two lines on it. And then when I saw my audience, I had to scratch those two lines off and I had to be creative because I did not want, um, them to be afraid of what I'm saying. I wasn't there to throw stones or to talk about uh, the past of, of slavery uh, directly and who, who, who the participants were, but I just wanted to share um, our family story and a little bit about the country of Angola. And uh, it, it turned out really well. They have invited me to come back in the spring to share because they knew I was going to Angola. So I'm looking forward to going back to that group and to share the story. Great. That's so great. So my last question is just, do you have any last words for the audience? Anything yes. You want to um, yes. Well, first, I would like to thank you. Uh, bring a folding chair to uh, thank you for inviting me to share a little of the William Tucker 1624 Society and to talk a little about William Tucker. Um, I would encourage those who are listening to uh, talk to your, your parents, talk to your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your uncles, your aunts, about your family history to see um, how did they live? Where did they live? Where did you come from? Uh, what was the culture? Uh, was there anything passed down from generation to generation? Sometimes there's just simple things like a, a food recipe. Uh, what about work ethics? Um, so were there any businesses in your family? Talk to your family, learn as much as you can. Sometimes these, um, these little gadgets right here take a lot of our time and we get away from um, 
a, a lot of uh, basic uh, skill sets that we actually grew up with and listening and learning and asking questions of those who are right beside us so we can really learn our history. So I would encourage the audience to dig deep into their family and don't forget to bring a folding chair. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes, we have to go dig deep into our family and just know what our family history and stories are. Love doing that on my mom's side and on my dad's side recently. So it's a great just privilege to have to be able to speak to your members of your family, your older members of your family, and just hear what they have to say. So I just want to thank you, Vincent Tucker, and the William Tucker 1624 Society for being my special guest today on Bring a Folding Chair. You brought your chair to the table. Absolutely. This was a great informative talk, and I hope that my audience will be able to go learn more about the William Tucker 1624 Society, the story of William Tucker in 1619, and just look into their own family histories like you just said. So for my audience, as usual, I'll be putting any links to any of this background information on any of the major things we discussed in the YouTube and Instagram description. I say make sure to follow up on our speaker and check out the Society's social media pages and Instagram and their website. BAFC has a lot more content planned for the future because this is only February. It is only Black History Month, so we have several more months to go with lots more content planned. So please don't forget to follow us on Instagram at bring underscore a underscore folding underscore chair and on YouTube at bring a folding chair. So we're also always open to any suggestions for topics. So go to our suggestion box and drop that suggestion in there. So thank you for watching. Peace.